I want to present uh, the SUIT project, Sustainable Urban uh, Cellular B2X, with uh, Intelligent Radio Environment Twinning. So my name is Thomas Svensson, and then Anders Log will be a sidekicker uh, for this presentation since quite short. And then below you see um, all the project members, and I think at least how is here um, today. So this is the outline. Introduction to digital twinning, digital twin platform, introduction to 6G and, uh, and CV2X, overview of the suit project, results, next steps and take home messages. So digital twin. Uh, a digital twin is a model of a physical system that mirrors the physical system in real time and enables analysis, prediction and control. Uh, a digital twin answers two basic questions. What is? That is analysis based on data, supporting operation and maintenance of a system, for example, a city. What may be prediction based on mathematical modeling and simulation supporting planning and development of a system, for example, a city. So why create the digital twins of a city? 68% uh, of world population is estimated to live in urban areas by 2050. So there are many tasks, manage urban resources, adapt to climate change, improve wind comfort, mitigate traffic congestion, combat social and spatial segregation, plan for fire safety, enhance urban sustainability, control noise pollution, predict the infectious disease spread, monitor air quality, optimize parking management, scale the infrastructure maintenance, and the in the context of the uh, 6G digitalization that uh, aims to, to support the deep, deep digitalization of society, um, it will, can, can create a, a nerve system and, and sensors for a smart city. The DTCC platform is a common open platform, support research and development, support dissemination, explore how to build platforms for digital twins of cities, and it's open source based on the MIT license. Uh, there are data simulation layers for uh, wind comfort, air quality, pollution, noise, energy, mobility, flooding, underground, and electromagnetic fields is what we want to add. So why do we want to add that? Well, a quick recap on where we have been coming from, where we're going mobile communications. In 4G, we, uh, we came and uh, we opened up for mobile internet with rich multimedia. And we did it by tracking uh, properties of radio propagation in time and frequency. Um, so we wanted to have that knowledge. In 5G, we do further densification and we, we plan to use millimeter, uh, or we are using millimeter wave spectrum. And that means we are very interested in the spatial properties to control the communication more in detail in space. That enables high speed, high capacity mobile internet. We are also supporting a massive internet of things, uh, and, and that's very useful for uh, smart cities. And by having a very robust and low latency uh, capabilities, we can provide internet of skills, for example, controlling a vehicle remotely. In the sixth generation mobile communications, we see a further convergence here on digital human physical parts of our world. The pillars are trustworthiness, inclusion, and sustainability. And uh, with that, we, we think that 60 can uh, be an enabler to meet uh, societal needs and um, aligned with the United Nations Sustainability Goals. From a tech perspective, we see a convergence of communication, sensing, computing, storage with AI towards an internet of senses. Uh, and uh, this uh, illustrates um, some of the use case fam or the use case families that were identified by the Hexa X 60 flagship EU project that Chance is very active in. And the second one here you see is massive twinning. And there are a lot of use cases we've been working on there that are being involved in the next project now. The second one here is uh, to illustrate immersive smart city. So I don't go further here. I just want to highlight that. Smart cities uh, are important and, and digital twinning seems to be uh, important for 60 to support. Um, when it comes to the application of, uh, of uh, communications in, in, uh, to support the uh, transport, 
Cell V2X is a comprehensive road safety and traffic efficient solution that allows vehicles to communicate with other vehicles, pedestrian and cyclists via smartphones, road infrastructure, and supported by the mobile network. And this is to guarantee coverage and continuity of services. So the suit objectives, we put a recent roadmap here and we try to do pieces of it to, to see that it makes sense and then aim for a bigger project to us continuing. So the first one to develop an efficient algorithms using so-called reconfigurable intelligent services in CV2X. And to establish radio environment digital twin of the city with RDS deployment. And then to propose methodology for visualization of propagation environment and urban planning. So these are the design steps using the DT platform. First step is 3D model of context, then design alternatives, then interoperability considerations, simulations, and then assessment of results. So in the context of, uh, of uh, our project, the first is to have a 3D model of a given environment. The second is to consider where to put the RES. The third is to get channel uh, propagation um, knowledge and put it into a MATLAB simulator and uh, then simulate uh, the received power at the use of the different edges, different places and then draw heat maps. So this uh, we illustrate here with the uh, early results. We have a 2D uh, um, model. Uh, well, uh, there are the three destructions, but there are 2D properties and uh, two buildings. And then we had add emitters and receivers and then we are co get coordinates uh, of uh, distant dependent signal path losses and blocking models. And then we are considering where should we put the, the emitters and where depending where the receivers are. And then you can see in the lower here, we have uh, some bad areas. And if we add, because those users are not so happy, if we add an RES, we can improve this area. And uh, this we can then further visualize in more detail. And there are much more visualization powers in, in the platform, DT platform that we are currently working on to further use. So additional results and next steps. We work on a magazine paper describing our vision and results on a 6-yard data twinning using the DTCC platform. And the math department is working with the InfraVis for dissemination of the DTCC visualization outputs. We have got a larger uh, project, two year, um, we call the DT6GV, funded by Advanced Transport, that started January this year. Agu has acquired a VIA International Postal Grant uh, that will work on related things in the 60 Command project. We continue collaboration based on SINT um, with Singwell University on hard fingerprinting assisted ML beam prediction. And uh, we have been involved in the EU application uh, for, called Meta Verticals for data twin of 60 applications. Um, and we are working on, uh, we, we, this will be part of a, a PhD student profile in the White Tech Vinova Center. And we have some further discussions there. We also have a, a Magri ITN where we are pending and there will be uh, one PhD student at Charm as well at Ericsson if we get it. And we are working on another project together with the traffic market in this direction and also simulation possibilities with a Canadian compact or Remco. And this, I don't highlight anything more than this is the project and just that we are now staffing up with more people. So we are boosting this direction. So key take home messages, Dicta Twinning has great potential in 60, 60 Dicta Twinning applications, are Dicta Twinning for 60 context state communications, the DCC platform is a versatile platform that can be expanded to support 6G. And we have this follow-up project uh, going now. So that's it. So uh, since many years back, we have been developing hypothermia systems uh, that outperform the currently available clinical devices. And our solution is based on ultra wideband technology, and it turned out to be quite promising to achieve the necessary focusing capability. Uh, and uh, over the years, or in past years, we could actually show that uh, this technology can be applied uh, for treatment of brain cancer, uh, which is which is an application that is not. Uh, possible today or possible with uh, current devices. 
And uh, here in the first slide, you can see uh, the numerical uh, study on uh, focusing into, into the large tumor that is unlighted in, uh, in white. Uh, next slide, Gregor. I think it's, yeah. So what is uh, um, so what is the clinical impact or uh, why we should uh, apply hypothermia is that the current uh, current technology for brain cancer treatment uh, um, is not too bad one can say and if we focus on um, children it's uh, over eighty percent of children who survive their cancer the problem is that uh, these uh, cancer survivors have a long uh, term side effects, um, uh, serious cognitive deficit and uh, other other problems. And these are mainly caused by uh, radiation that must be applied in order to uh, to treat the cancer. Uh, microwave hypothermia is uh, an option that is possible for other uh, other tumor sites or other cancer sites, uh, and uh, but not in in the brain. Uh, but uh, it is known to uh, to uh, I, sorry I, I forgot the word. Uh, but uh, it uh, if combined with radiation therapy, it allows for a decreased dose while <clears throat> keeping the uh, the same clinical <coughs> results. And what is hypothermia? It is uh, uh, heating of a uh, tumor to 40, 44 degrees C for typically 60 minutes and uh, given uh, typically in one once uh, per week. Uh, so we, in, in our project, the idea is to use hypothermia as a complementary treatment uh, to the classical therapies like surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation therapy. Uh, next uh, slide. Uh, so in uh, our, uh, let's say at our department and in our group, we are quite good in uh, antenna system designs. You can see one prototype to the left. Uh, <clears throat> we are also good in numerical modeling and optimizations and treatment planning algorithms, but our weakness is the hardware part. We are using on-shelf on components, and uh, that, of course, that we can call a little bit as our weakness. Uh, so, but what is what is our ambition uh, currently is actually to not only develop the thermal therapy device uh, for for brain, uh, but we also want to use the microwave. To for imaging or control of our heating patterns in terms of microwave tomography. And this is uh, where the collaboration with Gregor and MC2 comes into play in both uh, senses. So how we can support this dual mode uh, hardware-wise. Yeah, so for, for this project that we applied for the seed money, actually our vision was to go from this state-of-the-art applicators or hypothermia treatment systems that you see on the bottom left, where conventionally you have like a high power amplifier cabinet that is able to produce uh, a few hundred watts of RF power at a single frequency, and then is connected with long lossy cables to some applicator where you lose some of this uh, expensively generated RF power uh, to actually apply it to a patient uh, and move to a system that you see on the right-hand side where you have some applicator modules that could be reconfigured for uh, individual uh, patients and individual applications. Uh, and all you need to feed into the system is DC and control information because these miniaturized modules are employing high efficiency power amplifiers, so they don't need to be that bulky anymore. Uh, and um, being able to directly uh, place them on an applicator, but also to, to be able to tune them to different frequencies. Because in Hannah's work, she was able to show that like being able to utilize different frequencies and potentially quickly switch between different frequencies for the heating, you can really use this uh, focusing uh, and are able to adapt to individual patients. 
so you see that we 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 need this miniaturization, we need high efficiency power amplifiers, and additionally, conventionally for these wideband applications, the antennas that are used are both high antennas. So these are symmetrical antennas that require a, a ballon to be fed by an asymmetrical power amplifier and by coaxial cables, as you see in the left conventional system. And the other idea was to develop custom, custom power amplifiers that are push-pull, so differential, so you can get rid of the ballon and uh, make sure that over the whole frequency range, you have a truly 180-degree uh, excitation antenna and symmetric uh, excitation for the fields. So uh, for the requirements, uh, this directly translates to uh, having a, a highly efficient push-pull power amplifier uh, so the question is how to how to be able to implement this. Uh, as I mentioned, you, this allows to get rid of the lossy cables and the ballon, uh, and the efficiency is mandatory for being able to get this miniaturization that we require. Because of course, classically, the size of this cabinet is mainly dictated by the by the cooling requirements of the power amplifiers that are not very efficient. And additionally, we would like to implement some impedance sensing. So we can actually detect the reflected powers uh, because uh, many conventional systems don't have appropriate feedback mechanisms actually detect what the fields are that are really applied to the patient. You do some elaborate uh, planning beforehand, but afterwards you are you more or less go, uh, and then you hope uh, that the that uh, if the patients feel any pain, they will push a button. But there is no way to actually in automatically detect how the fields are applied within the brain. Uh, or whatever application area you are, you're going for. So we are interested in actually measuring uh, the impedance that the antenna sees that is connected, and we can uh, compensate from whatever we have in treatment planning uh, to be able to apply the correct uh, fields at the right locations. So for this to work, uh, we need this uh, efficient power amplifiers, but you also need some control algorithm that can sense the amplitude and phases uh, once we have these uh, detectors in place that are actually able to detect this. And then idea how to build this is in the bottom right corner. And so we actually uh, spent the seed money on uh, looking uh, into both from the technology perspective, how can we make this uh, tunable PA uh, work by looking into components for this frequency range. This is a relatively atypical frequency range from a communications perspective, uh, going starting at 300 megahertz and trying to make CW uh, so continuous wave power amplifiers is not what typically the mainstream uh, research in power amplifiers is going for, but having like tunable, very compact uh, amplifiers is also interesting from a research perspective for me. Uh, and so uh, we spent some money on uh, Amanuensis students to actually look into look for, for different components and they could uh, in simulations uh, demonstrate 70% uh, efficiency with some transistors that they found. And then we also looked into high uh, power capable reactors, which is uh, definitely a bottleneck for these tunable high power power amplifiers. Uh, and the students identified more than 90 different reactors and did nonlinear simulations to see an example of that, how the quality effect of the reactors of one particular reactor varies with drive power uh, and also bias voltage. Uh, and we found some interesting varactors, including some barium strontium titanate uh, varactors that we are going to investigate further in the future. And we also have actually another research project currently ongoing where we look into these varactors. We also recently published some work on some alternative approach using gallium nitride power uh, transistors to actually act as varactors, which is something we could also use for a follow-up project. Uh, additionally, we also looked into this feedback system and how this is done, but I can go back to Hannah because she was more observing this, this student. <laughs> yeah, so we, we, we can see uh, this project as a two-step project to have the future solution and to have also an intermediate step. And this can be seen as this intermediate step when we uh, build a control box. Uh, we call it control box, but uh, basically it is... Uh, uh, it is a feedback system that uh, uh, provides a reference signals and then sends both uh, forward signal and reflected uh, signals and compare the, ampli the plant uh, amplitude and phase with the, those that are actually delivered. And um, I think uh, I don't need to go much into details uh, here. Um, but it's a 16 channel uh, system uh, and uh, it's based on uh, gain and uh, uh, phase detectors. Um, 
yeah i think you can go ahead very good so to to talk about the continuation so we have uh, submitted a few proposals uh, so I submitted the VR proposal grant uh, last year, which was unfortunately not granted. Then there was also some uh, KW research project grant uh, that we wrote together and uh, Hannah uh, wrote an ERC consolidated grant. Uh, we have ongoing projects. Uh, so as I mentioned, the uh, uh, varactors that were identified are actually currently uh, investigated more in a Vinova funded project that is together with Saab. Uh, they are also interested in high power tunable amplifiers. Uh, so there's some overlap here that uh, we can also leverage for, for future projects here, the knowledge that we regain from this. Uh, we also have some open joint master thesis uh, project. Uh, we're looking for candidates, suitable candidates for that to actually investigate more how these PAs can be implemented. And uh, as a next steps, of course, we are going to look for more funding opportunities to, to try to push this further. Okay, I don't know. We're open for questions, and maybe Hannah, you can remove the errors. <laughs> I I tried. I did not <laughs> succeed. It, actually, <laughs> okay. I think it's there Excellent. for forever. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm going to give a very brief introduction about the work uh, of our project uh, with the title Towards Radar Based Gate Analysis for the Elderly Using Machine Learning. And this is a collaboration between the Department of Electrical Engineering and uh, Computer Science Engineering. Uh, so my presentation is going to cover the following aspects. First, I'm going to uh, uh, give a bit introduction about the background. So why we do such a work? What is the motivation of our work? And then uh, some words uh, about the purpose and the aim of this specific project. And after that, I'm going to also uh, speak a, a few words about the work package that is uh, has been uh, defined and done in this project. And then uh, slides about the data collection. After that, I'm going to show some results from different work packages. And the last will be a summary on the future plan. So uh, when it comes to the motivation, so uh, why we want to do such a work, what is the need here, there? Uh, so this work the, is about the using a radar technology for gate assessment. About the balance and the gate assessment is actually quite common and in the uh, clinic assessment for disease diagnosis and for the effective evaluation of medications. And also it's very commonly used for identify for risk for the elderly. And it's also and pretty common in the evaluation of rehabilitation outcome. But now today in the clinic settings, the gate assessment uh, are mainly done and through visual observations, which basically is, is late eye examinations by specialists and which are uh, subjective and also leads to uh, variations. And there are some gold standard, which is called the motion capture system. And but this a uh, gold standard is very, how to say, um, a resource required because it's so first of all it's very expensive and then it need to have a dedicated space and uh, and the third is it's a very complicated uh, procedure so um, according to my contact with medical personnel so they don't use that often uh, uh, unless that's just only for research purpose and then there are also variable sensors that you can use to uh, basically, this is accelerate millimeter, and you put on the different body part if you want to measure the movement of different uh, part. But but the uh, disadvantage is that when we put something on the body, and then you is that it's quite hard to make sure that it will not obstruct the normal gait. So what you measure is not the real thing that you you want to measure, and also to if we want to uh, sort of record the motion for different body parts, which means that you need to wear multiple um, uh, sensors, variable sensors on the body, which is not very comfortable and convenient. So there is a high demand of uh, cheap and easy to use, but also an obtrusive method and for the objective assessment of gait. So that's uh, why uh, the, we, we proposed this project. Uh, so the project is about, as I said before, is about radar-based uh, method for gate assessment. 
and basically with this radar sensor and uh, um, the work is done uh, by sending out uh, electromagnetic waves and to uh, a person and then the signal will be reflected back and then captured by the radar sensor while uh, the reflective signal will carry the information about the, uh, the person and who has a different motion activities. And by analyzing the signal, and we can extract the motion features of different body parts. And in this project, we are using 77 gigahertz millimeter wave radar sensor, which can give us very fine resolution. And so the purpose of this radar-based method is to, we hope that it could increase uh, the quality of assessment by uh, providing objective data. And it's also, and uh, we and expect that it could provide feedback to the patient, which could increase the patient's willingness to participate in the rehabilitation, for example. So this is very important uh, for to, uh, to get the uh, rehabilitation done in an effective way. And with this method, and we believe it could uh, contribute to uh, optimize rehabilitation program and, to, uh, and which will lead to a more person-centered rehabilitation. Uh, in this specific seed project, the aim is to investigate the feasibility and potential of machine learning and for the method that we proposed. So uh, the project and, um, is composed of three work package. The first work package is a benchmarking test. And in this work package, and we try to answer this question, how well can reader measure the foot velocity pattern in comparison with the gold standard, that is say the motion capture system. And the uh, second work package is the generation of trajectory, which is very crucial and for our method to obtain and the motion pattern of different body parts. So in, in this package, and uh, we and uh, we answer the question, how we we'll obtain a more precise trajectory with machine learning. And the third package is about gait classification. And here we try to answer the question, can normal gait and abnormal gait be distinguished with machine learning and how well? Uh, so the data collection is done in two different places. The first is a phys physiology lab that is uh, located in the um, Fuse building and at Shamash. And in this lab, there is a motion capture system, which is uh, composed of 12 and qualified motion capture cameras and two qualified uh, video cameras. And in this data collection, and we uh, collect the data from subjects uh, simultaneously by using radar system and motion cameras. And here for this data collection, we have four subjects and working with normal gate. And also we try to imitate the Paxson gate by just looking at the videos. And the second place is in the, our own lab, which is recorded by Medical Electromagnetics Lab. And there we only do radar measurement. We have three subjects and working with normal gate and also imitated Parkinson's. Uh, so here uh, are some results. The results that is for the first package benchmarking test. And these two figures and shows the captured foot pattern and by both a motion, a radar sensor and motion capture system. Uh, while the uh, black colored and is the radar sensor data, while the blue colored and is the motion capture data. And so this, as I said, mentioned earlier, this is for two and uh, subject and who tried with a uh, normal gate, that is a slow walking case. And which we can see here for these two cases that and the, the peaks of the velocity of the foot velocity and also where the peaks appear and they agree uh, very well with each other. But we can also see that if we look at this uh, a bit lower part, we see that the radar and uh, signature is a little bit different from the motion capture. And this can be well explained uh, by that the radar with the radar sensor, we are, capturing, uh, we are capturing all the things, not only the foot motion, but also the knee and also the torso, 
Well, with a motion capture data system, since we can put a marker at a specific position, so that what we measured is just as full velocity. Um, so uh, by, by comparing this, uh, the uh, black colored, which is a radar signature, and with the knee velocity by the motion capture system, and we recognize this, this part of deviations is actually because this is the knee pattern here. So similar thing uh, also and for the imitated Parkinson gates and between uh, comparison between radar and the motion capture. And we can uh, see the same twin that with the foot velocity and they agree pretty well with each other. Uh, but we also see that now this is the pattern of the knee and the torso and which we, we haven't sort of uh, put the comparison data here since this focus of this project is on the foot where the most of the parameters can be extracted by the foot pattern. The second package is the generation of trajectory. And um, as I mentioned earlier, the, so in order to make this method work with the first step, we need to have a very good and tracking plot. And this left side, which shows the range profile magnitude, which basically means the uh, radar returns and from the uh, environment that the data is collected. And we see that uh, a, a clear and um, a plot, you can see a um, track that there is a, there is a person that is uh, about uh, a few meters away from the sensor and then approaching the sensor. But at the same time, we also see there are also other stationary straw scatters. So how to uh, generate a good trajectory? And uh, so that is a question for this um, the project. And the way um, previously, we just used a very simple method. We, we confine that the uh, movement pattern uh, within a certain range. But in realistic uh, cases, for example, at home, we we are not have this prior knowledge. So then it's, it's, this is actually an issue for us, how to and generate a good trajectory and in an unknown environment. So uh, in this work package, we uh, apply to use machine learning and to see how well and we can get a good generation of trajectory. And this four figures show just four cases. Well, this, uh, uh, what is this color? Let's see, this is orange colored and shows the annotation. And while the uh, blue color shows the prediction and with the machine learning, and which is very promising. Uh, the last work package is about gate uh, classification. Since in the data collection, we have both normal gate and Parkinson gate. So we want to investigate and if we could and uh, differentiate and it's two different types of gate and how well and we can differentiate that. And so in total, sorry, we have uh, 24 sequences and uh, which is 816 segments for turning and I have eight sequences which is 170 segments for testing. And then the algorithm and has achieved 19.5% precision and 88.2% recall. And here I just want to mention that and uh, due to the limit of the time limit of the project, so uh, we we haven't got probably we we think we could probably it's more uh, how to say um, we should get more data collected data in order to just validate and uh, and the accuracy of this method. So to summarize and the test that we have done in this project and show high quality measurement of foot velocity patterns as well as biomedical radar. And the machine learning shows a great potential and for addressing important and challenging aspects and for this project. And here I will only include the two uh, aspects I'm sure. And there are uh, many more that and could be explored in this uh, uh, big project frame. Uh, the future plan, so we're gonna go into um, collect more data and to have a quantitative measure of the reliability and accuracy and of the development method. And we will explain the machine learning work packages to more complex scenarios. So here we just collect data in two different labs and we want to uh, see more realistic cases. 
And also, we're going to extend the collaboration, our collaboration to address other challenges. For example, here we we'll only look at the foot pattern. And there is also a strong interest to look at the arm swing, for example, for Parkinson's disease. And we have got some funding from Promobina and Christina Stimberry, which can give us a good condition to continue the work. So that's all for our project. Thank you.